Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the new format Political Economies of Forbes new digital TV channel. Started in a crisis, but made for the future. My name is Niklas Sintermeyer. I'm a journalist of the German-speaking issue of Forbes, and I will be your host for the upcoming weeks. With this new format, Political Economies, would like to argue, debate, and discuss about the financial and political implications of this current coronavirus crisis. I want to get to the bottom of these and many more things by doing interviews with professors and deans from universities, researchers and scientists from think tanks, economists, and of course, political scientists. I'm very pleased to have my guest here. It's Eric Jones. He's, um, he's director of the European and Eurasian Studies Program at the School of Internet Advanced International Studies of Johns Hopkins in Bologna. So thank you very much for your time. He's an expert on European integration, European financial markets, and I think we'll cover these topics together. It's terrific to be here, Nicholas. Thank you for having me. Thank you for your time and willingness. Um, so you're based in Bologna since several years, of course, as being a professor for political economies and European studies. Um, Italy was hit very severely by this coronavirus crisis, like in Europe, five, six weeks ago. And also like Premier Conte then ordered like this national shutdown at the beginning of March, that really all businesses, almost all businesses and production gonna be stopped. Um, as a first question, how did you respond and react um, in the first place to this shutdown? And as a second question, how do you deal personally, like in a professional context with this shutdown since then? I think, the, I think the first question is a really important one. You know, like, like for most people, it was for me a learning experience. My son goes to university up in Milan. So he was one of the first people affected, I mean, among many, many, but one of the first people affected because his university was shut down long before the rest of the country was. And we were meant to go up to see him in Milan, uh, but instead we had to bring him from Milan back down to Bologna. And, and even then, the seriousness of the situation did not sink into me. I, I went on a planned business trip. I came back from the trip uh, and, and discovered a completely changed world. And all of Italy went into lockdown soon thereafter. Now, now the impact of this lockdown is actually dramatic, as you suggest, right? And, and it's dramatic because of the fall off in all of the retail activity, but it's also dramatic because of the fall off in the productive activity and the part of the country where I live, Emilia Romagna, is amazingly productive. Fortunately for somebody like me, I have a job that I can do from home, but for many, many people, they can only work at work and it must be terribly frightening and, and disturbing for them not to be able to do so. Let's talk about like the financial implications, um, especially like in the European Union. The European Commission said like this impending financial crisis and recession is gonna be more severe than the one like in 2008, 2009, and even some experts say like more severe than the one during the Great Depression in 1930s. Um, like the European Union um, organized, so to say, like a Corona package with more than 550 billion euros with this new credit lines from the European Stability Mechanism, this new insurance, um, unemployment insurance scheme by the European Commission. And of course, also like the boost of this credit lines um, of the European investment banks for businesses. Altogether, is this really enough to tackle this um, financial crisis in Europe? So I guess I would start by saying it's not, first and foremost, a financial crisis. It's an economic crisis, an economic crisis that we've just described where people are being forced to stay home and not produce anything. And, and the problem is that, well, it's twofold. One is that different countries are being hit at different points in time. And as the different countries get taken out of the global supply chain, that disrupts other parts of the chain as well. So, so we're seeing that this, this crisis is going to have a cascading effect on the way in, but it's going to have a cascading effect on the way out at the, same, at the same time. And it's going to be very difficult to emerge from. That's the first problem. The other problem, the second problem, is that these countries go into this with very different means at their disposal. Uh, and so, for example, where Germany went through the last crisis relatively early on from, let's say, 2008 to 2011, Italy went through the last crisis very late. It started in 2011 and went through to 2014. So Germany actually had much more time to recover from the last crisis and was in a much better 
situation than Italy was. Uh, and, and so we need to figure out how to equalize that because it's as important for Germany to have a strong Italian economy as it is for Italy to have a strong German economy. Now, now the package that you described from the European Union is, is an excellent stopgap measure for the start of this crisis. It, it, it provides mostly credit guarantees. So when you list that giant 500 billion headline figure, um, much of that money is money that will be lent on the back of guarantees that are much, much smaller provided by the European Investment Bank or by the European Commission. Uh, and, and, and that will help to keep credit flowing in this early phase of the crisis. But it does nothing actually to respond fundamentally to the crisis. It's just gonna get us through the lockdown after which we're gonna have to worry about how we rebuild these economies uh, and, 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 and indeed how we sustain them across the life of this virus and until a properly functioning vaccine is in place. So what has to be done more? Like if you're saying it's, it's, it's not enough, um, maybe enough at the moment, but what has to be done more like in the long term, like on this side? So there, there are three things that are gonna need to be done, right? The first is gonna be credit relief for the private sector. Think about it, every restaurant right now is empty, but every restaurant right now has rent to pay for the facilities that they use, and they probably have loans to pay for the capital that they bought, right? So the, all the, the kitchen equipment and, and all the rest. So, so somehow we've got to get them through that process. That's the first thing. The second thing is we've got to stabilize incomes for individuals. So we've got to make sure that all the people who are on furlough are paid and, and those people that get unemployed get some income compensation as well. And then the third thing that we've got to do is to, to provide enough capital so that firms can reinvest, right? Because they've got to rebuild their inventories at the end of this initial phase and then restart the value chains. And that restarting of the value chains is going to be a very, very complicated and expensive process. Hopefully we'll have enough money to get us through all of this, but even then jumpstarting the economy afterwards is going to be an expensive proposition. You, you mentioned Italy before, um, like Italy together with Spain was most severely hit, as I mentioned before, by this coronavirus crisis, by these medical implications. Um, the, the Bank of Spain said like the GDP, like in Spain is going to shrink this year up to 13.6%. Like in Italy, the figures are around 9%, some say even up to 15 and 14. And of course, also Italy struggled with a huge um, debt to GDP ratio, it's up to 136%. So how to deal with these um, countries in the South that are most suffering from this crisis? So it's, a, you know, it, it, it's an interesting problematic, right? I, I say that, you know, I, I don't want to diminish the, the terrible human suffering involved, but it's an interesting problematic because, you know, the country that gets hit first obviously has to do all the learning by doing. In the learning by doing in the Italian case, I've already described, they, they thought they could get away with shutting down a small part of the country. The part of the country that they shut down is actually the most productive part. So it's, it's likely that we've already lost 5% of GDP just this quarter, right? Uh, in, in, or last quarter. And as we go into the next quarter, the, the impact is going to become even worse. And, and, <clears throat> and so as Italy is losing all of that, the debt to GDP ratio is necessarily going to go up because the denominator is shrinking underneath that and because they're going to have to add more money on top of it. So the government is debating right now a 50 billion euro package that comes on top of a 25 billion euro package they've already put into place. And I guess though the, the answer to your question is the governments are going to race as hard as they can in order to keep up. But, but the grinding away at economic performance underneath it means we're going to have a significant debt problem at the end of this experience. Like also, like Italy and Spain together with France is pushing forward for the introduction of the so-called corona bonds. It's about borrowing instrument, instruments that member states could use to, to get the resources and the money they, they, they would need like to tackle the crisis and also to come out of the crisis in the best possible way at the best, of course, at the cheap price. There's a much of a political controversy because like the northern and central states like Austria, the Netherlands, of course, Germany, and they're, they're posing this idea of the, of the corona bonds. Why is it such a controver controversy going on within the European Union about this topic? 
I think, I, I think there are two different reasons why it's controversial. One is because we've had this conversation before. We had it during the last crisis, which in contrast to this crisis was a financial crisis. Uh, and, and in the context of that financial crisis, there was a lot of talk about the mutualization, in other words, the sharing of existing sovereign debt. Now, there are good technical reasons why you would want to do that, but politically it turned out to be a non-starter, as a consequence of which the people who won that argument last time would not to see that, like to see that argument revisited. And they look at the current debate about corona bonds or whatever you want to call it, uh, and, and, and they say, We're, we've already had this conversation. We don't want to have this conversation again. It's done. The, the, the second reason is I think people are failing well to appreciate the nature of the crisis that we're facing, right? So I guess a better analogy would be uh, to, to imagine this is like a war. I don't believe it's a war on a virus, but, but, it, but the financing requirements are like a war because we don't really know how long this is going to take before we get an effective operational virus or vaccine. Um, we don't really know how deep this is going to go into our economic performance. So what we need to be able to do right now is to borrow a significant amount of money for an indeterminate amount of time and preferably at a very low rate of interest. And the only way that the Southern Europeans can do that is if they pool the credit worthiness of all European countries together to achieve that objective and then issue a bond that has a very long maturity structure that could obviously be paid off early, but, but would have a very long maturity structure because we don't know when the crisis is gonna end. And, and, and that debate is hard for people to get their heads around because they look at it and they go, well, wait a minute, if we do that, to what extent is everybody responsible for each other's borrowing? And the answer is you are, but, but, but not really. I mean, Italy is still gonna pay back the money Italy uses, Spain will pay back the money Spain uses and all the rest, right? Um, but, but most important, everybody can only pay back any of the money if these economies grow and all of these economies are connected. So there's a very strong interest in ensuring that the money is available to limit the economic damage as much as possible. Wrapping people's heads around that is a complicated proposition. I, I mentioned like, like the, the division between the North and Central States and the Southern ones. How likely the, is it that they are gonna find a solution or they are gonna agree on these co current bonds? Well, they're going to find an agreement. Um, it's, it's unlikely. There have been very few cases where the European Council has not agreed on something, right? Um, and whether the agreement extends to uh, a particular configuration or not really depends on how the bargaining takes place. We've already seen some mutualized debt being issued, right? When we talked about what the European Commission is doing, in the context of the credit guarantees that it's offering, uh, well, it's going to offer credit guarantees on debt that it is going to raise itself and then pay back out of its own resources. That's the SURE program to subsidize unemployment regimes across member states. So we've already gotten some agreement on debt mutualization. We just haven't gotten the big package that the, the Spanish and Italians have asked for. Um, I want to refer to French President Emmanuel Macron because he said like in an interview in the Financial Times that um, the Euro and also like the Union itself is going to be threatened if like the Northern States, Germany, Netherlands, not going to show more solidarity about um, towards like the, the Southern States. Do you think really as a, as a the, the worst po um, possible, worst possible um, outcome, so to say, that really the Euro and the Union could be a threat because of this ongoing uh, controversies? I think, it's, I, I think it's under threat from both sides, right? I mean, it, you know, one can imagine a situation relatively easily where governments in, in the Netherlands or, or even in Germany make concessions that they cannot justify easily at home and suffer political consequences uh, as a result, right? And, and, and one can also easily imagine governments both in the Netherlands and in Germany that would be less favorable to European integration than the governments that exist there right now. Same thing is true in Spain and, and in Italy. The, the difference in the Spanish and the Italian cases is that there's an economic component to the conversation as well. So it's not just that the politics could go wrong, uh, but, but we could do serious and lasting damage to the Spanish and Italian economies in, in, in ways that would hurt European economic performance across the board 
and jeopardize the continuation of the euro as a single currency. So I think we have to be attentive to the fact that the balance of risk is greater in the South than it is in the North. And I think this is what, what President Macron uh, was trying to say. Remember, when he talked about an anti-European government coming to power, the, the veiled threat is that that anti-European government would be headed by Marine Le Pen and, and her, her Rassemblement National. Uh, we would like to talk a little bit about the European Central Bank. Um, if we jump back in history, so to say in 2012, the ex-ECB chief Mario Draghi safeguarded the euro like the Eurozone crisis, but with his famous speech and words, we do whatever it takes to preserve the euro. What he tried to do is, of course, to address this financial fragmentation in, in the European Union and to, to make sure that this monetary transmission mechanism is ensured. And then also, like as a second program, the ECB started to, to purchase um, um, government bonds. Um, if we jump to, um, to the current coronavirus crisis, so to say, the ECB also announced, like in the mid of March, it's going to buy additional 750 billion euros of European government and corporate bonds. It's the pandemic emergency purchasing program. Um, as a broad question, what's the role, or what role does the ECB play in the current coronavirus crisis? Well, the, the role that the ECB is playing is a very complex role in the sense that it's both ensuring that there's adequate liquidity for all firms that need it across the euro area. So it's, it's pushing that liquidity out into the banking sector. Uh, and, and, and at the same time, it's also preserving the monetary transmission mechanism, which is a polite way of saying uh, it, it's ensuring that the interest rates that are being charged are relatively similar from one part of the euro area to the next. Now, that second piece is the piece that's controversial. That's why they're doing all of the, the large scale asset purchases and why they promised the outright monetary transactions in 2012. Um, those are programs that are very difficult to explain to the public because it looks as though the, the ECB is essentially printing money to safeguard governments like those in Italy and in Spain. But the reality is a little bit different. What the ECB is trying to do is to safeguard the financial market integration that makes the common market function as a whole. And, and it's invested a huge amount of resources in achieving that objective. Um, as a last question, I would like to draw a little comparison to the United States. Um, as of nowadays, like the United States is most severely hit by deaths and infections of this corona pandemic. But like on the other, on the other side, uh, there, were, there were many um, financial packages and very huge ones were agreed upon. Like, for example, the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act, which mobilized more than two trillion U.S. dollars, including grants for incoming support unemployment and health and there's also like the two trillion um, economic stabilization package it's going to provide for example direct payments to individuals but also like for those suffering from losing jobs why is the united states as it seems acting faster and more united than in comparison to the european union I think that the, the easy answer to your question is the United States looks that way because it has a Republican Congress and a Republican president or a Republican Senate and a Republican president. One can imagine if there was a Democratic president and a Republican Senate that we would be having a much more difficult time right now. And, and, and all I have to do is to point at the difficulty that Barack Obama had pushing his stimulus package through in, in 2009. Um, but, but, but leaving that aside for the moment, the, the other thing is, is that with a unitary government, what the United States has been able to do has been able to channel this massive budget uh, <clears throat> and, and push the debt off well into the future. Whether that's a smart thing is another question. I think it's probably an essential thing and have explained why already, uh, but, but, but the way it's done, one could argue about. And, and, and while it's happening, you have to look at what's going on at the state level as well. One of the, one of the things that you might want to think about in the context of the, the, the Coronavirus uh, Emergency Stabilization Act, which is the subcomponent of the CARES Act that provides grants to state and local government, is that the federal government is in many respects 
ensuring that the states have the resources that they need to respond, right? Uh, and, and that extends not just to the state level, but to the local level as well. That's something that you can do in the United States. It's a little bit more complicated in the European context. Eric Jones, thank you very much for your time and answering our questions. I hope that we can speak with each other soon. And I wish you all the best in, in Bologna. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk. Thank you. See you soon. Bye. You bet. Bye-bye.